This is a series about the unexplained, about things that are seen and yet not seen, about events that our common sense tells us can't possibly occur, and yet they have occurred, burned into people's memories, never to be forgotten. Our stories come from all over the country, and they involve people who didn't have the slightest belief in the paranormal until it forced its way into their lives. In this series, we tell their stories and we grapple with the uncomfortable questions that arise. What is happening? What do these stories mean for our understanding of the way the world works? And what does science have to say about it all? There are far too many of these happenings for them simply to be brushed aside. They have now to be confronted. This is one of a maze of tunnels under the old treasurer's house in the ancient city of York. It runs down into the cellars. It also happens to lie right in the center of the old Roman fort that occupied this site 2,000 years ago. It was here that one chill February morning, Harry Martindale, plumber, was sent to run in a new set of water pipes. Uh, my job was to knock a hole through where this pipe is here, through the ceiling. I uh, came down, spent a whole day knocking the hole through the ceiling. I had no idea then it was several feet thick. And I came down here the second day, continued to knock the hole through the ceiling. I uh, had a short ladder in the centre of the floor here, and in the centre of the floor was the original Roman road, and it had been laid out in sections. You know, I knew whatever it was was old, but I had no interest in it. In fact, I put the base of the ladder on the Roman road. Just before lunchtime, I started to hear the sound of a musical note. There was no tune, just a blend of a note. And I thought, well, someone had a wireless on another part of the building. And the sound got louder and louder. And I realized at the same time, the sound was actually coming from the wall here. And when I realized this, I just glanced down in line with my waist on the right-hand side here. And I saw that a figure had come out of the wall. What I was looking at was the top of a helmet with the plumes on. Now, I knew whatever it was shouldn't have been here in the cellar with me. And through the shock and the terror of seeing this, I just stepped back off the ladder, landed on my backside, and then scrambled into the corner of the cellar there. When I looked at the figure, it was almost a complete figure of a Roman soldier. He came out of the wall, what, at a slight angle towards the wall opposite, and as soon as he cleared the wall, then a horse came out of the wall behind him, with the Roman soldier sat astride. Now once the horse had cleared the wall and was going through the wall opposite, then Roman soldiers came out in twos. Now, I was in no fit state to count them as if they were going into the ark, but there were at least 20 of these Roman soldiers appeared here. This extraordinary apparition took place in what must have been one of the busiest parts of the old Roman fort on the main road from the northeast gate, running towards the main barracks. The treasurer's house, where Harry was in the cellar, lies on the edge of that road. We're standing now on Chapter House Street, which is close to the line of the Roman Via Decamana. That is the main Roman road, which led from the northeast gate of the fortress, away in that direction, to the headquarters building of the fortress, which is away to my left. And Yorkminster now stands on the site of the Roman building, and some 12 feet below the great um, medieval cathedral, you can still see remains of the Roman walls as they were excavated in the late 60s. Immediately to my left here is the cellar, and this is where the surface of the Roman road was found when the cellar floor was taken up. And this is where Harry saw the soldiers. Now, terror uh, is, is a difficult word. I think what I felt in here was worse than terror, and I can assure you, your hair does stand on and you can actually feel this because what I was looking at, although I only had one single light in here, what I was looking at were same as you and I. But the difference between them and me was they were coming out of a wall. The wall didn't exist as far as they were concerned. The only other Roman soldier I'd seen prior to this is what we call, or what I call, the Charm Hessen, riding a beautiful horse, very smart. These were complete opposite. The first thing that struck me was how small they were. They were very small indeed. Another remarkable thing that when they first came out of the wall, I couldn't see them from the knees down until they came to where the Roman road had been excavated. 
and I could see them from the sandals up. So much so that when the horse came through the wall, and when it was going across the, where the Roman road had been excavated, I could see that the fetlocks of the horse were real bushy. It is this kind of strange detail that lends credence to Harry's story. These ghostly soldiers were clearly walking on the old Roman road surface. So only where the cellar had been excavated back to that level could he see them at full length. Over the Roman period, the road has been remade and uh, resurfaced and the ground level has risen. So I presume that Harry has seen soldiers perhaps of the late first century, in other words, of the Ninth Legion who were here in York at that time. This man, who knew nothing about Roman history or Roman military equipment, was able to give a detailed description of the soldiers' appearance, right down to their weariness and the stubble on their chins. I wouldn't say that they were all that smart, although they all had the same uniform on. The helmet, the metal helmet, came right underneath the chin here, and from where I was sat with the single light I had on here, I could see there was growth of hair here on the face. They had the coloured plumes coming out the top of the helmet, and as we were going by, I could see they were going down the side of the, uh, the back of the head here. They all wore the same thing. On the top, over material, were strands of leather all the way around. And the only thing I can say they had on under it was a skirt, like a green coloured skirt. All of them carried a short sword on the right hand side. This was the side nearest to me, and it was a short sword, like an oversized dagger. Harry's description, given very shortly after his experience, was examined in great detail by historians. It proved to be accurate in just about every detail. The armour that the legionaries wore was what was called lorica segmentata, which is thin strips of steel which were attached to a leather base. And um, they are a very distinctive feature of, the, uh, of legionary um, armour and um, would have provided, on the one hand, very good protection for the upper body, but at the same time, flexibility. The Roman soldiers sacrificed their um, protection below the waist to mobility. All they had uh, below the waist was a sort of spurron-like affair, which was a, th a series of strips of leather which had metal plates on it. And then, of course, they had the uh, tunic underneath um, their armor. But in one crucial detail, Harry's description seemed to be totally wrong. In his written testimony, he described the soldiers as carrying rounded bossed shields, quite unlike the traditional Roman rectangular shields. But in fact, this single detail only served to underline the veracity of Harry's experience. One was carrying a long, like a lance affair, and one of the soldiers that were walking out of the wall carried a shield. Now, in the centre of the shield, it was like a raised bulb. Now, Harry refers to round shields, and we don't normally associate these with legionaries. But the Roman army also included auxiliary troops, and these were soldiers who were recruited in frontier areas and from subject peoples and so forth, and their equipment was really rather different. And uh, we know, for example, that they did have rounded or oval shields. So it may well be that what Harry has seen is a detachment of auxiliary troops who were attached to the fortress in York for some particular function. We know, for example, that at Cawthorn, which is to the northeast of York, um, there are a number of um, fortifications there which include a couple of what we think are practice camps. So in order to keep their hand in, as it were, the soldiers were sent out to, uh, to train by building practice fortifications, rather in the way that soldiers are um, kept busy today. The last thing that the Roman um, authorities wanted was soldiers sitting around with time on their hands. The terror that I felt was because I could see them exactly as I can see anyone else here now. So I thought, naturally, all they had to do was just glance to their right and see me there in the corner. And obviously, I think the terror was in case of doing me any harm. But they didn't. They just looked ahead of them, going through the wall opposite. When the last one had cleared the cellar, gone through the wall, and I couldn't hear or see anything else. Then I made my escape out of here. When Harry described his remarkable experience to the curator of the museum at York, it turns out that he was by no means alone in having seen the legionnaires. Mud bespattered, weary, returning perhaps from a training exercise or a cross-country forced march. In a sense, it could be said that the Roman camp in York is still active. And that seems to be true 
of many other Roman sites around the country. The Roman legionnaires are still with us. Romans occupied this country for over 400 years. They had over 25,000 men stationed here, and they imprinted themselves very firmly on the British landscape. They brought with them their architecture and their technology. They built cities and forts and farms and villas here, linked by a network of arrow straight military roads to move their legions quickly to any trouble spot. They made wine here and reared families, grew up and died here. Thousands of Romans lie buried on British soil. For a long time, Colchester, out on the East Anglian marshes, was the Roman capital of the country. One of the roads leading out of the city ran east to West Mersey Island. The modern road follows the old Roman causeway. West Mersey Island was well developed. It had farms and villas and a Roman princess. Legend has it that she was married to a centurion from Colchester and that she is buried in a large burial mound, quite close to the road. Some local people would claim that the Romans are still active on West Mersey Island. Jill Smeaton, for example, who lives very close to the burial mound, has heard them. Well, in 1987, um, I'd been living here, I suppose, then for about 10 years. And I'd always been a little bit frightened, perhaps, when I was going out to do the late night feeds, because we keep horses here. Uh, but after nine, ten years of seeing and hearing absolutely nothing, I'd forgotten all about it, to be honest with you. And then suddenly it was the night of the autumn equinox, as I say, 1987, September the 23rd. Very, very black night. There was absolutely no moon whatsoever. The tide was over the strews, so we were actually cut off at that time. I think it was around three or four in the morning, and I'm a very, very heavy sleeper. I don't wake up for anything normally. And yet suddenly I just sat bolt upright in bed because going past my bedroom window, we live in a bungalow, um, was the sound, very, very clear, definite sound of two horses unshod, walking along as though they were going through reeds or long grass, which was extraordinary because I'd cut the grass that very day. It had been long, but it was completely shorn. But it was a swishing, whooshing noise. And coming behind these two horses was the sound of very, very heavy wooden cartwheels just rumbling along, not going very fast as you might imagine a chariot but just rumbling along, whether it was perhaps a funeral procession, I don't know, it could even have been that, but it was such a heavy wagon or whatever that they were, or cart that they were dragging, that the walls of the bungalow were actually reverberating. It was really like being in the middle of a, a Western movie, just the, the noise of the horses and carts going past. And um, my friend in the room next door heard exactly the same thing. And uh, although she's a much lighter sleeper than I am, I mean, I'd normally sleep through anything, but we both rushed out into the hallway. And uh, funny enough, her husband didn't hear anything, nothing at all. And yet the two of us heard this tremendous rumbling noise going past, thought our horses were out, looked out of the window in a panic, thinking we were going to have to rush out and herd them up. But they were just going past too slowly for them. We couldn't see anything. And our own horses just few hundred yards away were completely silent. Um, so we then heard it move away. We looked through the windows, couldn't see a thing, but again, as I say, it was completely black. And it seemed to move across the road, away from the Strood, and go up in the region of Dawes Lane. Many other people have heard similar sounds of carts and chariots moving across the island. Others claim to have seen the centurion husband, perhaps on his way to visit his wife's tomb. One September night, my friend and I came back from Colchester. We've been to the local, well, one of the pubs in there and had a few drinks and saw some of our girlfriends and that. We came back onto Mersey, I'll know the Strood, on the East Mersey Road. As we turned into Dawes Lane, about 400 yards up the road, where there was a pond and haystacks, misty night in the headlights. This figure came out between the pond 
and the haystacks walking towards the mound. And uh, he looked Roman centurion. He had a little helmet on with an eagle on the front. He had a shield. He had a sword. Uh, he had a uniform on and he thought he had a red skirt. But he couldn't see his legs. And um, we stopped the car. And uh, my friend said, we'll have him tonight. And uh, he jumped out of the car and I followed. We went about oh, 400 yards down the road where there's a mound, a um, Roman mound, with an opening in it. And um, he sort of looked at us and then he disappeared. We were coming along Mersey Strood one evening at about 12 o'clock. It was high tide and a full moon. And as we were going along the Strood, I was happened to look across the opposite side of the road and there was somebody walking along and I looked and it was the Roman ghost. And I said to my husband, oh look, there's the Roman ghost. And my husband said, don't be so silly, what are you talking about? So we turned around and came back and we came along slowly and um, I wear my window down on my side because I was on the near side and mm -hmm. had a look and there was this Roman and my husband saw him as well. He was all dressed up and holding his um, two sp spears and he was, had all the leather sort of skirt on and, and he was sort of very upright and straight and he was quite a large man and he was just looking straight ahead. He was looking, all, you know, his, his face was all rounded face and his eyes was just looking st straight ahead. And um, we went further up, turned round. Then when we turned round, came back, he just completely disappeared. And the water was at high tide, it was level with the pavement. And there was no boats, no cars, not a bicycle, nothing. And he just completely gone. Sounds, of course, totally inexplicable. What can possibly be happening in these kinds of experience? How can Roman soldiers still be marching across the countryside nearly 2,000 years after the legions left these shores? What do the scientists have to say about it all? Well, that's the major question. When the Society for Psychical Research was set up over a century ago by a group of very distinguished academics from Cambridge University, the belief was that they would, uh, very quickly, by using scientific methods, they would find out exactly the reality or otherwise of phenomena of this kind. Well, 100 years later, we're still searching, we're still looking. And the society over that century has had many of the most brilliant scientists in the country as members. All that they've been able to do in the end is to be relatively convinced that these phenomena happen, but uh, we're very, very far from an explanation of them. It ends up in the end as a matter of belief. One extraordinary theory that has some currency argues that in some way buildings and rocks and the earth itself absorb energy from living beings who inhabit them. And that later on, under certain conditions, that energy, that signal, can be replayed, rather like a CD or a tape. Indeed, it's called the stone tape theory. You have to postulate that in the case of a typical haunt, some very emotion-laden scene or some very important scene from the point of view of the humans who took part in it has somehow become registered on the environment, not necessarily within a house, maybe even outside, and that it looks, it's almost like a sort of psychic video that has been created. And someone who comes along who is sensitive enough to act as a psychic video player will actually play that tape and see the figures or perhaps even hear voices or hear sounds. And it is nothing, it is nothing to do with the people who originally were there. They're no longer there. It's simply a record. If you imagine some sort of environment whereby, say, some individual undergoes some drastic effect, like decapitated or something like that, then the energy liberated at that particular point in time in fact, is transmitted, expelled, 
into the surrounding material and stored in that material. These subtle energies, a series of vibrational frequencies, can in fact then be read out at some later time, very much like a, say, a video recording. So a sequence of rather drastic events can in fact be recorded in living matter. At the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, one eminent physicist, Brian Josephson, expresses an even more outlandish possibility that inanimate matter could actually have consciousness. In its present state of knowledge, he argues, science couldn't deny such a proposition. Well, the idea that um, a piece of matter can hold impressions of the past is a very surprising observation. Um, it would be very hard to explain. And the only way I could understand it would be if the um, stone or whatever it was had some kind of consciousness and could remember on account, um, on, on that account. Um, now, whether it could have consciousness or not, um, we don't know. Consciousness is assumed to be always connected with brains, but we don't really have any kind of theory of consciousness uh, in, in science which would tell us that it should be associated entirely with brains. And so if science were ever to have a proper explanation of consciousness or a proper theory of it, it's um, always possible that it might allow uh, a, a wider collection of objects than just brains to possess it. I, my hope is that science will be able to uh, demonstrate these things in a reliable way in the future and be able to provide a scientific explanation for them in the future, which is in no sense, of course, saying that they would not therefore be spiritual or religious also in, in orientation, because the two things need not, need not be separate in that sense. But clearly science is still struggling for an explanation of things and events that it's not really equipped to explore. Meanwhile, there is no doubt in the validity of Harry Martindale's extraordinary experience. It is burned into his memory as vividly now as on the day he experienced it. One of the churches I belonged here in York, they uh, put pressure, pressure on me as a Christian. They didn't think it was right that I should mention my ghost story. Um, I went along with this for a while. But then I think, no, why? Why shouldn't I mention it? I'm not trying to convince you that what I saw in here happened. I know it happened to me. Whether you believe this or not, I, it just doesn't bother me whatsoever. No one has ever turned around to me and says, you're a liar. These gently rolling fields, so typical of the British countryside, are just a few miles from the city of York. But this innocent looking landscape is soaked in blood. Beneath it lie thousands of human bones. 350 years ago, these fields were the setting for the bloodiest battle ever to be fought on British soil, the Battle of Marston Moor. Fought between the soldiers of the King, Charles I, and the men of Cromwell's Republican army. It was the British equivalent the Bosnian Civil War. Both armies were cut to ribbons. Whole companies, regiments even, were wiped out. The ground was littered with the dead and the dying. And then on the following day, the scavengers moved in to strip the bodies and tip the corpses into mass graves. Those graves have never been located. Marston Moor remains the final resting place for thousands of unquiet dead. What happens at Marston Moor is that Prince Rupert sets up a trap whereby the enemy opposite are going to come down from their high dry hill, cross over a ditch and a bank and attack his army in the mud of the moor on the far side. It doesn't happen that way because the enemy opposite know that they're going to get into trouble if they come off their hill and the enemy's ready. So they wait until the whole day's gone by and evening has come. Prince Rupert gets tired of waiting, thinks there'll be no battle, knocks off to have his supper. So do his troopers. That's the moment when the parliamentarians decide to attack. They can see campfires going up, which indicate the enemy eating their supper, they're off their guard. And they can also see the royalist reinforcements from York marching up in the distance behind. They can't wait for those people to get there. 
and therefore the parliamentarians attack after a thunderstorm of rain when everything's soaking wet and the enemy's at their lowest ebb they plunge in After that, nothing is left as night falls except to surround the Royalist infantry and kill them or accept their surrender. The civil war that raged across this country for several years witnessed many bloody battles as Englishmen killed Englishmen. But Marston Moor stands out as a field of slaughter, where the foot soldiers were trapped in the heart of the battle and cut to pieces by the wheeling cavalry. No quarter was given. Famous regiments were cut down to the last man. The crack regiment from York, the famous White Coats, the crack regiment of the Royalist General of the North, Lord Newcastle, fights to the death. It's offered mercy again and again, but it refuses to take it. Its colonel is shot from his horse, and his remaining men close muskets and pikes together inside a, a hedged enclosure, and that's their cemetery. They fight on and on and on, shot down from all sides, until there are but a handful remaining. And those are taken prisoner as they fall wounded upon the field. A moon comes out, lighting up the whole ghastly scene of the plunging horses, the screaming and falling men, the pikes waving in their ranks like poles in a bean field in a high wind, and ever and again the puffs of musket smoke coming up from the uh, hedged and entrenched musketeers as the lead shot whistles and plunges again and again to human bodies. Country people are brought in, they dig deep pits. They count 4,200 bodies slung into one group of pits alone. It's very unusual to sustain that amount of carnage in a battlefield in the Civil War. And you remember this is an old-fashioned war with no antiseptics, no antibiotics, no anaesthetics. So for every person killed in the field, you can reckon maybe two or three dying of wounds later. We'll never know the butcher's bill, maybe 8,000 maybe more, as a result of that day. Over 5,000 men lie buried in nameless ditches here. The farmers plowing the fields have turned up all kinds of fragments, weapons and buttons and buckles and so on. But no one has yet discovered the mass graves. This pond is thought to be one of them. But ever since that hot July day in 1644, there have been stories of men in cavalier or roundhead clothing apparently seeking to escape from the carnage. Well, there are many legends associated with the battle. Um, one of them is the roundheads marching up Bloody Lane. Um, whether or not they do, they're supposed to be only seen the top half of them. And you can hear the clank of the armour and the sort of noise of the battle sometimes. Again, there's the headless horseman. He rides across the ridge. Um, Different people have seen different things, but um, basically it's all cavaliers and roundheads. Um, people will never go along the road uh, the night of the battle, um, the 4th of July, 1644. The anniversary of that is considered uh, a time when you see ghosts because so many people have seen um, Civil War soldiers going up and down that lane, which is a country lane between the two villages, Marston and Tockworth. And I do believe it, because so many things have happened in the vicinity of Long Marston. People, even to this day, are still seeing things. I think you've got to sort of be a little bit of a sceptic, because locals tend to colour everything rather a lot, just to sort of make it sound better. But um, over the years, you know, they, they tend to open up and they come out with quite a few varied and colourful tales. And I think out of all of them, you can pick out the few that sit, tend to crop up all the time. So, you know, I don't disbelieve in them. Living alongside uh, an old battlefield is often a very uncomfortable experience, especially as this battle, in English terms, wasn't that long ago. It was a particularly bloody battle. Horrible things happened there. Whole regiments were wiped out on the spot. And somewhere or other, that landscape is rich with thousands of human bones. Unreclaimed, lost bones, uh, wandering souls. And so it's not surprising that whether or not there's objective truth in paranormal phenomena, people in that area will see and hear things at night. The moor is a tainted place. It has a ghastly reputation. It's a graveyard. It's a graveyard of unquiet dead, those who died screaming those who never wants to die in that place. And above all, those who died 300 more years ago without Christian burial, no prayer said over them to help them, which is a great comfort to people in that age. 
Not only did they die in horrible agony, many of them, but they died with the spiritual agony of knowing that nobody was going to whisper a few things to help God take them. Their chances of going to heaven were dramatically reduced. Similar sightings continue to the present day, often seen by people who have absolutely no knowledge of the battle or its location. One man, for example, an Italian, has very little knowledge of English history. But one night, he was returning home on his motorbike when he narrowly missed two figures limping along the edge of the road, known as Bloody Lane. His name is Piero Prizzi. One night when I finished to work, I was uh, coming back to York and, uh, with the motor bicycle. When, when uh, I arrived uh, on, the, on the bend of this road, just about uh, 50 yards from here, is uh, two people who were standing in the middle of the road. And at the time, I thought it was uh, two people dressed like a party dress. And at the time, I thought it was too drunk, you know, he's just uh, finished the party and just uh, was going home. To try to avoid them, I scrape all, uh, all uh, on the, the footpath and I just managed to stand up and nearly crash. And I stopped in there. And uh, when I turned, it was nobody standing. But uh, I think it was the shock or, uh, or of the thing. I, it's, I got, uh, it's imprinted to me, you know, the, the two people in, in my brain. It's, uh, it was uh, a light like a, a floodlight from a theater. And it was the two people, the light was inwards, but a very, very brilliant light. It was uh, the color, I was able to distinguish the color of everything. One person, he was running to to another person, more or less. It's, uh, one he was standing, the other one he was running, and uh, uh, he was uh, with uh, the 17th century boots, the, the the trousers. It was 17th century. It was uh, the it was blue blue, very very dark blue trousers, with uh, his white shirt all running out. And after the other one, he was uh, st uh, standing and looking towards, he was just a house in front of him, but he was looking like that, very, very intense, like if he was seeing something. Towards, he was looking towards uh, Maston. For people to see and hear the events that took place on a battlefield many years earlier is by no means an uncommon claim. There are stories of such happenings from all over the world and from all ages. In America, for example, at the sites of many of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. The Battle of Cedar Creek in Virginia is one such place where Sheridan's army inflicted a major defeat on the Confederate forces when all seemed lost. Strangely similar indeed to Marston Moore. Many visitors claim to have heard the sounds of the battle, bugles, the shouts and screams of men, the firing of muskets and cannon, coming from nowhere around them as they stood in the sunlight where the soldiers fought. Indeed, hearing the sounds is a remarkably common report. There are extraordinary stories from famous modern battlefields, Dieppe, for example, in Corregidor. And some people claim that the sounds of the muskets even the high emotions of the battle still hang over these farmers' fields from 350 years ago. Well, I, I don't walk on the moor uh, anymore. I, I really can't bear the, the oppressive feeling. Um, it, it's a very tense feeling. It, I feel as if I can't get off of the moor. I can't get back up to the road. Um, it's a very heavy feeling. It's a feeling of, um, of great disaster, which obviously it, it was, but it's very oppressive. And um, I certainly cannot go any further down the moor than the original uh, musketeer lined ditch line. I can't go past that. It, you know, it's frightening. Many people in the Marston area claim to have seen the soldiers from the 17th century, really in groups, sometimes a horseman, most frequently just one or two men together, one perhaps supporting the other. 
They see them not as wraith-like figures, but as solid bodies, moving along the lanes beside the old battlefield. I'd been at my brother's house at Long Marston, which is stuck that way. Um, I was cycling back be about midnight. Um, I got somewhere near the monument and something caught my eye that was sort of over here on the ridge. And uh, I didn't look at first, I carried on cycling for a bit and then I stopped because it was in my head and you know, I'd seen something that it seemed odd. So I looked up to the ridge and somewhere round about there I saw somebody riding a horse or walking a horse, you know, they sat on the horse. And uh, I looked and I thought, oh God, what's that? You know, I mean, what, what's somebody doing out this time of night on a horse? And then I sort of realised it wasn't somebody sat on a horse riding, you know, it, it was something else. And I don't know, I didn't know what I thought at the time. I was like mouth open, you know, staring at it. Um, so it was a, a moonlit night um, and it was clear. Um, so I, I, I could see it, but it wasn't like, you know, if you saw a person on a horse, it would be very distinct in moonlight, casting shadows. Well, it, it didn't look like that. It was um, sort of dull, faded. Um, I looked at him for about a minute, minute and a half, and uh, I just decided that was it. I'd seen enough. Jumped on my push bike and cycled home as quick as I could. Um, I kept it to me, pretty much to myself. I told my mum. Um, she was quite interested in it. Um, but I didn't tell anybody else. I didn't think there was... It was one of them things, you know, that if you go in the pub and say, oh, I saw a ghost last night, the whole pub's rolling around laughing. So uh, I didn't say anything, but it, it sticks in my head as clear as it was yesterday, you know, as if I'd seen it last night. I was walking along one evening, uh, watching the sun setting over there, and uh, noticed some people walking along the top ridge of the field towards Cromwell's Clump. And then all of a sudden saw a, a horse and rider come galloping over the ridge and diagonally down the field. Um, it was a dark horse. The rider on it was dressed in a, a sort of terracotta, plant pot coloured um, outfit. Any more description than that I really didn't see. Um, but it was moving at some rate and, and it, it would have see, it seemed to me that it was going to collide with the people walking up to the ridge. Anyhow, the horse galloped across the, diagonally across the field to where there was a hedge and I wondered where the horse was going to go. But as it reached the hedge, it actually just dispersed. It was just like a, a, a ball of dust dispersing and it was just an amazing there was an amazing feeling to I knew that there was something wrong and went back to the monument and waited for the two people who were walking across the top to come back to the monument and asked them if they'd seen this horse because it had gone straight past them and they said no there'd been no horse no rider had seen nothing and it was then that I realised that I'd seen something that had no explanation. Well, I have a friend who works in Weatherby and I see her quite regularly. We happen to be talking one day about this, um, about Marston Moor, and she sort of questioned me. And uh, I said, well, why, why the interest? She says, well, we were driving back late one night across the moor and um, she says, I saw somebody crouching in a ditch and she said, I thought he had fancy dress on. And uh, I pointed him out to my husband, who couldn't see it. And I said, well, he's there. And she said, he's not there. I said, he is, look. Um, she says, by that time, we were past. And she said, I never thought any more of it. I just thought it was my imagination. She says, and until you start, you know, we started talking about this. And I said, well, it was possibly an apparition because at, at the end of the battle or towards the end of the battle, a lot of the soldiers, um, both cavaliers and roundheads, hid in ditches and bushes and all around, trying to sort of escape the sort of troops afterwards. So I said, it's a possibility. It could be an apparition from there, hiding in the hedge bottom. He might have been killed there. October 73 middle evening time, I was sitting in the house with just the dog and myself um, and the dog started growling and sort of whimpering which was a bit unusual for him because if there's anybody around or cars pulling up he used to bark very 
noisily. And so I came to the back door, which was, before this was rebuilt, just over there. And I looked across and there was somebody leaning on the gate. Um, so as I walked round the drive and started approaching this gate, it was, this one's been replaced, but it was in the same sort of position, somebody leaning on it like this. And it, and it just disappeared in, in front of me and um, I felt very uneasy, all the hairs on the back of my neck sort of stood up. So I got back into the house and got a torch and had a good look around up and down the road and in the side field, couldn't see any anybody around. And um, the strange thing was that the dog, who would usually be sort of out and run off or if there's anybody visited, he'd be straight to them and jumping up barking. He had disappeared back into the house and was behind a chair sort of whimpering and his hackles were up. So what is happening in these extraordinary sightings? Soldiers seen limping from a battlefield 350 years after they've died. Can they all be dismissed as hallucinations, seen as they are by different people at quite different times? And hallucinations in any case is simply a vague and slippery word used to describe something we can't explain. Do we have here yet another example where, as some people believe, moments of powerful emotion and the anguish of violent death are trapped in the rocks and stones to be replayed at some later time for those who are keen enough to hear? To make sense of it, we have to step outside the materialist reductionist idea of what a human being is, a very complicated electrochemical physical mechanism with the mind and the personality seated in the brain's operations and that when the brain dies and is destroyed then that is the end of it. If those cases of apparitions of information given that was not in any person, any living person's mind are authentic then it would appear that there is a part of a human being that can operate independent of time and space. I'm sure of that. And may even be able to operate independent of mortality. The question of survival of mind after death is one of the oldest problems that we have. I think if you're going to inquire into that, a very good uh, model to look at is the near-death experiences. And we've looked at a large number of near-death experiences. I've had over 2,000 experiences given to our unit. And if you look at these, there is a common feature. And the common features are as follows. When the brain is so disrupted that it can't support consciousness, consciousness can occur. So that is a, a really difficult problem for science. The second question is that these people report subjectively a continuation of consciousness in such a way and with such similarity between all the accounts as to lead one to believe that that might in fact be exactly what's happening. So the hypothesis that there is a potentiation of consciousness after brain death I think is on the scientific table and I think we just have to accept that. Yeah, psychologists generally uh, and neurosurgeons uh, are very intrigued with the idea whether the mind is in the brain. Is the mind just the workings of the brain? Or is the mind working through the brain? That is, is the mind non-physical and normally works through the brain rather like a driver works through a car? And you can't find the brain, sorry, you can't find the mind in the brain any more than you can find the driver in the engine of the car. At the moment, in terms of um, the kind of evidence that we have, it's impossible to decide one way or the other. Now, if you like to take the view, as some people do, that the mind is separate from the brain and usually operates through the brain, then you could say that when the brain dies, the mind survives, and it is that that is actually operating here. An important point that is often overlooked, where the paranormal is concerned, is that it doesn't take a whole battalion, so to speak, of paranormal happenings to challenge and put in question the received wisdom. If just one of these happenings is established or authenticated, it challenges our view of what survives a human being after his worldly death. If we accept that even 
a small fraction of these cases that have been investigated and accepted as authentic by societies such as the Society for Psychic Research are actually true, that these things actually happened, then they must tell us something about human nature, about human personality. When you do investigations, you find that a lot of people have those experiences. And as I say, even if only a percentage of them are telling the truth, then they mean something. Professor Archie Roy is by no means alone in believing that we've gone well beyond the time of asking if these events are happening. Science, he argues, must now move on to grapple with the implications of their occurrence. You've got to start saying, supposing this is true, what does it mean? And I think that we have come to the stage, oh, quite a few years ago, with respect to psychic phenomena. We have to say, supposing the findings in the various branches of psychical research are true, what does it mean for human personality? And I think we have to take that leap. We have to try desperately to give reliable theories of process. They are, they are the only things that will give us fresh observations to make and the only things that will persuade people to take the subject seriously. I draw a parallel between um, using a Ouija board, asking whoever's there to respond. It's rather like living in a city with a notice on the front door, everybody welcome, anybody welcome. Sooner or later, somebody will come in and do damage. One thing I found from doing Ouija boards before, that it doesn't answer anything unless you ask the question. So you have to be very thorough and make sure you've asked everything you need to ask. It wouldn't necessarily then go on and tell you what he did, where he lived, you'd actually have to ask the question. So it's quite easy to miss things out. So the next question we asked um, was, how long had he been dead? And in a process of actually spelling out letter for letter, it said 150 years. Watford is an old market town that lies a few miles to the northwest of London. It's a town that goes back a long way. St Mary's Church, for example, dates from the middle of the 13th century. Today, it's a typical, crowded, busy suburban centre with lots going on. Our story comes from a part of the town where the old and the new come together. The ancient church, a row of old Georgian houses, and a bustling modern shopping centre. In one of the shops, which is used as a studio, some of the staff began to notice some strange things going on. Nothing particularly frightening or alarming, but disturbing and nervous-making, mainly because they kept happening and they couldn't be explained in any rational way. The staff were very edgy. Um, they sort of walk around in twos and they're saying all these little stories about things that go bump in the night. And I'd, I thought someone was trying to wind me up. I'd heard little things. I didn't really think much was going on because I hadn't seen visual proof of what's happening. Um, <laughs> it started pretty weird. The, the camera would sort of turn itself on and turn itself off. Lights would go on and off. And I really thought there was somebody in the studio who was doing it to wind up everybody else. There, there was a lot of talk about the atmosphere um, within. Um, there'd been lots of things happening, pictures flying off the wall. Um, nobody liked to be in the studio on their own, um, you know, after, after hours because it was such a, a frightening atmosphere. Um, so they tended to all kind of scoot off together at, at the end of a the day. Um, they, were, they were scared. The people were scared in there, yeah. Well, what would happen is we would um, lock up the studio at the end of the night. On the wall of the studio there were a series of portraits because by the nature of the business we had lots of families and lots of groups of children in to be photographed. So what we would do is take a whole variety of shots and then on the wall those would be reproduced as a series of portraits. So we'd have things like mum and dad, a family picture and two children picture, all from the same family up on the wall. What would happen is we'd leave the studio, lock up and go, 
um, and we'd arrive in the morning and find that maybe the mother's portrait would be substituted or switched with a mother from another group. Or we'd, ge we'd generally come in and find that, that the items in the, in the particular groups have moved around. The camera's actually set up onto a computer system, so it'll tell us when the film is finished, when the supply film has um, run out, how many exposures we've got left on the tape, um, how, how full the camera is really. And it would say, oh, two exposures left, when I know there's a brand new film in the camera. So you'd have to stop and change the film and then you do like a family sitting, normally about seven or eight photographs, and then it would tell you the film was empty so you'd have to change it again. And after about the third go, you just got fed up of it. So you just have to reset the camera and sort of carry on going. Um, but in the middle of sittings, you'll turn around and say, oh, hang on a minute, folks, I've just got to change the film. And it's like, oh, it gets frustrating. Eventually, because these happenings seemed to be increasing, three or four people decided to hold a Ouija board session. It was all very lighthearted and inconsequential, more curiosity than anything else. But they wondered if they could learn something about what was causing the disturbances. The Ouija board is a very old device. The ancient Egyptians used them to contact dead spirits. More recently, in Victorian times, they became immensely fashionable across Europe and America. All kinds of prominent people in society took part in Ouija board sessions. Today, it's become something of a party game. But there are many people who would claim to have had some kind of unexplained experience as a result of using them. We set the Ouija board up, and within a few moments, the glass was flying across the board. About 10 o'clock that evening, I decided to go home. I got in my car and I looked in the rear view mirror. There was an old lady sitting on the back seat. Very clear, clear enough for me to describe her. When I turned around, she disappeared. I didn't think a great deal more of it until the following week when we did the Ouija board again. But this time I asked the Ouija board who it was in the back of my car. The board and the glass very clearly spelt out the name B-E-A. It then went on to say that this was my great-grandmother and she was in the back of the car with me all the time. Well, I don't know the name of my great-grandmother, so I then, the following day, called my grandmother and asked her the name of my great-grandparents. She told me that her mother's name was Beatrice and that she was always known as B. This was kind of nice because it was, it was the feeling that it was all true, that there was really something to it, that it couldn't have just been made up by the girls or something. The following week we did the Ouija board again and I got in the car about 10 o'clock, looked in my rear view mirror and there she was again, just as clear as the time before. A short while later I was just approaching my home and a very good friend of mine lived on the left hand side of, a, of uh, some traffic lights where I pulled up. I hooted, he came to the window and he waved. He went away, he came back again within a few seconds and seemed to inspect the car a little more closely, waved and went away again. And I went home. I thought no more of it until the following morning when he phoned me and asked me who was sitting in the back of my car. When I asked him why he, did he ask that, he said, well, did you not see me return to the window? Because I knew you must have been on your way home, therefore why would there be somebody sitting in the back of the car? but whoever it was, was waving at me. But for all its apparent casualness, those in the know about these things, particularly psychic mediums and parapsychologists, who spend a great deal of time dealing with the after effects of psychic events, constantly warn against the potential dangers, dabbling in the paranormal in this or indeed any other way. It can, they argue, have all kinds of unexplained and unwanted results. We find often when people have been to fortune tellers or astrologers or have dabbled with Ouija boards or tarot cards that often what happens, the information to begin with is very good and interesting and factual. They actually find that the information that's part is accurate. So after a while they begin to trust the source of, of this information and then suddenly it seems to change, uh, change tack and begins to feed them inaccurate stuff, uh, sometimes absolute lies, uh, sometimes threatening them with death or with uh, very serious accidents, sometimes throwing doubt on uh, other uh, previously trustworthy uh, relationships 
you know, uh, one case, uh, a brother, uh, two brothers and, and the wife of one of them uh, played the Ouija board and it gave them a lot of information which was accurate. And suddenly one day it said, your brother is having an affair with your wife. And they were all stunned by this. And he, luckily, the, the husband knew there was no chance of this happening. Uh, and uh, they took the board out of the house and burnt it immediately. The assumption behind this kind of warning, and clearly supported by the experience of people like Tom Willis, would seem to be that there are spirits or entities or whatever involved in some kind of parallel existence. And if a channel of communication is opened up, they will make their presence felt. The trouble with using Ouija boards as um, as a means of satisfying curiosity, which young people often do, is that they go into it unprotected. And the, the, I draw a parallel between um, using a Ouija board, asking whoever's there to respond, is rather like living in a city with a notice on the front door, everybody welcome, anybody welcome. Sooner or later, somebody will come in who will do damage. And there are plenty of spirits of a fairly lowly sort uh, who are plain mischievous, who are able to mimic and pretend um, that they are much better souls than they really are until they get you trapped in following their silly instructions. And by that time, they've established such a rapport with you, or you with them, that you can't let go of them, they can't let go of you and won't let go of you, and they can make your life a misery. I was always fascinated by the experience of an American editor who um, began playing around with an Ouija board until he found, to his dismay, that one of these damn spirits had got inside his head and was permanently talking. He said it was the spirit of a Nantucket sea captain who seemed to be envious of the fact that I mean, he was alive and the Nantucket sea captain was dead. Well, he said some friend of his who knew about these things got him to go along, did something or other which um, is not described. Um, he had to write with his hand. Something took him over and his hand wrote, each of us has a spirit while alive. Do not mess about with the spirits of the dead. And he says, as this happened, he suddenly felt the spirit being pushed out through the top of his head. And he said, as it seemed to pop out of the top of his head like a cork, he felt incredible relief, as you can imagine. And in that moment, he said he could have told you anything about the future. In Watford, no one, it seems, had any fears about setting up the Ouija board session, although it's noteworthy that no one has wanted to repeat it since. And no one had any particular expectations. When they described it later on, much of what emerged seems to have been pure gobbledygook. But to their complete astonishment, they did seem to get some coherent information about a particular individual, a former schoolteacher, a name, where he lived, how he died, and when. The first question we asked was, who was haunting the studio? And it came up with the name of Keith Cook. So the next question we asked um, was, how long had he been dead? And in a process of actually spelling out letter for letter, it said 150 years. And we found out then that he taught at the free school. The next question we asked was why he was haunting the studio. Uh, and again, the glass moved with our fingers and spelled out uh, letter by letter. He wanted to be near the children. We asked him why he wanted to be near the children. And his answer to that was um, that he had been involved in a fire when he worked at the school. Um, and several of the children had perished in the fire and he had actually lost his own life by going back in to save the kids. We were told by Keith Cook that he was a middle-aged man and he had died during his middle age. Um, he also mentioned that in addition to working at the school, he had also worked at the workhouse which um, was situated adjacently and he actually resided at the workhouse. Um, apparently this, is, this was quite a common thing and, and People who taught in one often, often taught in the other. It seems inconceivable that any of this information could have been in the heads of the people who took part in this session. None of it meant very much to them at the time. Indeed, none of them did anything about it. But it raised the most fundamental question. Did any of this extraordinary detail check out in the historical records?
nobody who attended the Ouija board session in Watford had any intention of following up the information they seemed to have gained from it. If anything, the strange, unexplained activity at the studio increased. Almost directly after finishing the Ouija board for the few days after, and then the weeks after that, um, the disturbances started to get more and more severe. We thought probably at the beginning that it had, it had been because we knew a bit more about what had been going on and maybe we had just become slightly more sensitive to, to the atmosphere that was obviously building up in the place. Things got pretty hairy then. Um, it sort of happened so there was more frequency to when the events were happening. There was um, The backgrounds would still be changing around, things would still be moving and you'd say, oh, shut up, George, and half an hour wasn't long enough, he'd be back in ten minutes doing something else. So I think he was really trying to get somebody's attention, but there was nobody around who could really talk to him and find out what was going on or why he was still around. It was a very cold atmosphere. Um, it felt almost dark, like something was kind of surrounding you. It was that, it was that heavy. Um, you know, all the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. It was very almost like you were being watched and, and covered. It's hard to explain. Very heavy, a very heavy presence. But the story tugged away at Ian's curiosity. There seemed to be so much detail. Could it be possible that Keith Cook, schoolmaster, had existed? But where to begin the search? Watford is a big place with dozens of old schools. But then one day, over a year later, passing a converted office just round the corner, he happened to glance up his eye was drawn to a plaque on the wall. It contained the words, free school. Something clicked in his brain. That was how it had come out at the session. It launched Ian on a search that became an obsession. The school he learned had been founded as a bequest in 1709. There's an office building, um, which is actually inside the old free school building. And on the outside of the free school, there's a plaque which um, makes reference to the history of the building. There is quite a bit of information written about the school. Um, it had been the first school in the Hertfordshire area for the education of young children who couldn't afford to be educated privately. Um, the lady who actually started the school and arranged for the building um, had set aside an amount of money in her will to ensure the school had always remained as a school building. But there was nothing in all that long history that mentioned a master called Keith Cook. Although when we looked into it, there has been a continuous record of minor paranormal activity at the school. Myself personally, in the 10 years that I've worked for there, there's been a couple of times when I felt extremely uncomfortable, but you know, you sort of hear the, the, the things about ghosts and then you think, oh no, 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 you're being silly. But there was one occasion, and it was during the day. It wasn't one of the late evenings that sometimes I work on my own. It was actually during a Saturday afternoon. Um, on the ground floor, I went through, and I was working quite happily, and I went to go up the stairs. And I felt sort of buzzing around my ear, and I thought maybe I had a wasp in my hair. And I sort of brushing my hair and realised that it wasn't that time of the year and sort of all of a sudden there was this coldness around me and I, I don't quite know what it was, I can't explain it but all I knew is that Saturday afternoon I had to get out of that building so I did no more than set the alarm and go very, very quickly. So where to turn to pick up the thread of Keith Cook? Right next to the schoolhouse there was a row of almshouses or houses built for the poor that have been there since 1721. Could they possibly have been related to the workhouse, where the spirit or entity had described himself as living 150 years ago? As it happens, the very first national census in this country was carried out just over 150 years ago in 1841. Ian set out to check the census records for Watford for that date, a task that proved much easier to say than to do. It was very difficult indeed to locate the right piece of microfish, but when it came, the result proved to be astounding. And I went to the Watford Library and looked through the rolls of microfilm they keep there for um, the census. And the first census they hold there is for 1841. After several hours, two or three hours of looking through and with assistance from the librarians, we found a listing for the Watford Workhouse. And uh, a master was listed there by the name of Keith Cook. The fact of the 1841 census was an extraordinary coincidence. It 
prove beyond the shadow of doubt the reality of the information that had been revealed at the Ouija board session. There had been a Keith Cook. He was a schoolmaster. He had lived in the workhouses 150 odd years ago. When Ian checked the records for 1851, Keith Cook was no longer there. So how had he died? Where was the fire? When he went back to the school records, they showed that there was a strange gap in its activities between 1841 and 1842, almost as if it had closed down, but no reason was given. Then Ian discovered that it had in fact been rebuilt in 1842. Why would a school need to be rebuilt? Could this have been the fire that the spirit or the entity had referred to? The Watford fire records didn't go back beyond 1868, so they didn't help. But it looked as if, by some strange quirk of fate, Keith Cook had lived just long enough to be captured by the 1841 census and then had died in a fire at the school just a few months later, trying to save the children. I established the building had been rebuilt in 1842 because there's a reference to it in a reference book that's held in the Watford Library that says in 1842 the free school was built. All references prior to that were during the 1700s, which would obviously have been the previous school. Um, I can find no other explanation as to why the school would have been rebuilt with no detailed records kept other than there was a fire. When we finally found out Keith Cook had indeed existed, I was amazed. After a period of several hours sitting in the library, it was amazing to find out that um, that person had existed. Until then, it was probably a period of two or three years when we had known the name, but until I actually looked into the background of the story and found him, it was an amazing feeling to, to know that he existed. And gradually, other areas of the story began to slot into place. The story of Keith Cook, Victorian schoolmaster, is undoubtedly an extraordinary one. From the sheer difficulty we experienced in putting together the details of this man's life, it's quite clear that none of the people who attended that single casual session in Watford could have had prior knowledge of his existence. The information that came across was quite remarkable in its detail. The name, the age, where he lived, how he died, even the kind of school he taught at. The fundamental question, of course, is where did it come from? How is it possible that a man who died 150 years ago was able to communicate information about himself to a modern audience? It's a question that lies way beyond the bounds of conventional science. Like so many other stories in this series, it raises the most profound questions about what happens to the human mind after death. Sometimes I think the death is so sudden, occasionally some soul refuses to believe it's dead uh, and is invisible and nobody's taking any notice of it and it's in a permanent nightmare and is trying to say to people, look, I'm here, I'm here. Do objects fly about like that, you know? Um, um, and tries, first of all, to say, look, I am here. Do you realize you're not alone? Now you realize something's here. Now I'll try and let you know who I am. One of the many puzzling things is that the capacity of these entities to transmit information, uh, if only in order to prove who they are and that they have survived, varies enormously. In some cases, it can be extraordinarily detailed um, very specific, very specific in such a way as to provide veridical evidence, i.e. evidence which is not a, a known to or apparent to any of the people on, on this side, not at any rate until sometime later the evidence is checked and, and, and found to be accurate. That's the sort of thing for which there is a great deal of actual evidence which doesn't admit of any denying. To make sense of it, we have to step outside the materialist, reductionist idea of what a human being is. A very complicated electrochemical, physical mechanism with the mind and the personality seated in the brain's operations and that when the brain dies and is destroyed, then that is the end of it. If those cases of apparitions, of information given that was not in any person, any living person's mind, are authentic, then it would appear that there is a part of a human being that can operate independent of time and space. I'm sure of that, and may even be able to operate independent of mortality.